Good. So, good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome to the fourth session of Africa Waste Webinar Series. My name is Shiho Jinno, Waste Management Officer from UN Habitat, and I will be the moderator for today's session. So far, we have had this webinar series focusing on waste management issues in this rapidly urbanizing continent, covering the issues of waste collection, COVID waste, and dump site management. And we have learned challenges and solutions in the context of African cities, observing very interesting knowledge exchange between cities and experts. Today's focus is on waste and climate change, appropriate technologies and good practices in Africa, diving into the big issue of methane production and also how to access to the climate finance, inviting prominent speakers from the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, also Resource and Waste Advisory Group, Clean Climate Fund, and Regions 20. And so this webinar series is basically supported by the Ministry of the Environment of Japan through African Clean Cities Platform, as well as GIZ Covenant of Mayors of Sub-Saharan Africa, and the uh, UN United Nations for South South Cooperation as the part of knowledge sharing on municipal solid waste management. So before starting, I would also like to tell you about a bit of housekeeping rules. We have simultaneous translation between English and French. So please select your channel. And then kindly mute yourself when you are not speaking, but you are encouraged to turn your camera on when you are speaking. And uh, other, another point is we have a reaction button. So please make use of that button if you want. Also, please feel free to post your questions or any comments in the chat box. If time allows, we will have dedicated Q&A sessions after the presentations or panel discussion. So now let's move on to the presentation. Now we have many speakers today and the time is very limited. So I'd like to go to the first speaker, who is Sandra Mason. Uh, sorry, Sa Sandra. Let me introduce a bit about Sandra. Sandra has been the coordinator for the work on the municipal solid waste sector of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, CCAC, since January 2016. She has over 14 years of experience focusing on environmental policy issues, solid waste management, and the mitigation of climate change. Today, we will hear her insights on the outcome of COP26 in Glasgow, particularly on the methane bleach supported by 100 five countries and also what this means in waste sector and what we can expect from this. Okay, so now Sandra, please flow is yours. Thank you so much, Chiho. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, thank you so yes. much. Um, well, hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, as Chiho said, my name is Sandra Mason X and it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, like uh, Chiho also said, today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, well, about the outcomes of COP and then the Global Method Pledge more, but also I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about um, where I work, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, and basically our work, um, that the work the CCAC is doing to support countries to meet the pledge. Uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to thank uh, UN Habitat for inviting me to participate in this very important webinar. 
Um, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition uh, was established in 2012 to support urgent and collective action on short life climate pollutants. It is a voluntary partnership focused on action. The coalition is a partnership of over 73 governments and hundreds of other partners. Together, we're working to put the world on a pathway in, that rapidly reduces warming in the near term and at the same time maximizes development, health, environmental, and food security benefits. Each partner that joins the CCAC makes a commitment to reduce these pollutants and the coalition supports countries to figure out what the priority actions and the benefits are at a national level and then take action. The short lived climate pollutants that we work on are methane, tropospheric ozone, uh, black carbon, and um, hydrofluorocarbons. Um, this, um, Shortly, climate pollutants are climate forces many times more powerful than carbon dioxide. They're also air pollutants that are harmful to people, ecosystems, and agricultural pro productivity. And they're present in the atmosphere for a few days up to a few years. And that's why they're called short lived climate pollutants. Um, as, you, as I mentioned, methane is one of the short lived climate pollutants that we will focus on. And that's why it is why I'm basically here today to talk to you a little bit more about it. Um, as you know, atmospheric methane concentrations have grown, have grown as, as a result of human activities related to agriculture. So you can see it here, uh, including rice cultivation and remnant livestock, coal mining, oil and gas production and distribution, biomass burning in municipal solid waste uh, because of the decomposition of, of organic waste in landfills and large dumps. And emissions are projected to continue to increase for um, by 2030 unless we unless immediate action is taken. As you can see here, there are many impacts to, of, of the methane emissions in the in, in our planet. So um, there, in, in like like I mentioned, CCAC has been working on methane, and because of this, um, we the, in the momentum to take action on methane in May 2021, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and the UN Environment Program released a global methane assessment called GMA. It's a landmark report that set out to an opportunity to, to change the climate trajectory within the next 20 years. The report shows that human caused methane emissions can be reduced up by up to 45% this decade. Such reductions would avoid nearly 0 0.3, 0 0.3 degrees Celsius of global warming by 2045 and would be consistent by keep, with keeping the Paris Climate Agreement goals to limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius within reach. The assessment for the first time integrates the climate and air pollution costs and benefits from methane mitigation. So I definitely uh, ask you to check it out. It's, it's a very important um, report. We in the report, you can see that there are uh, different um, targets for uh, different sectors. Um, there, there are actually technical targeted control measures available today, today that could reduce methane emissions by 30% of the projected 2030 anthropogenic methane emissions. Uh, methane mitigation is very likely that is very likely the strategy with the most potential to decrease warming in the next 20 years. Most of the methane mitigation from technical control measures over the next decade come from the fossil fuel sector, which includes coal, coal and oil and gas, waste, and, uh, and rice production from the agricultural sector. Um, these sectors provide opportunities, while reductions from the livestock sector are less consistent and require behavioral measures as well. So you can see here that uh, for the fossil fuels, we can actually, by 2030, we can reduce methane emissions uh, from 60% in the ways that the emissions could be reduced from 20, 30 to 35% in agriculture, 20, 25%. And this, well, with low cost or no cost technologies. So um, as you all you know, um, in the global met, the Global Methane Pledge was launched at COP26 in 2021 in Glasgow by the United States and the European Union, with over 100, unit, well, over 100 countries on board, representing um, nearly 50% of all global anthropogenic methane emissions and over two thirds of global GDP. If the countries take action, more, more, more than eight gigatons of carbon dioxide and equivalent emissions can be prevented by reaching the atmosphere annually by 2030. 
The global methane flexion, pledge actually builds on the GMA convincing case that available low and ne negative cost emissions reduction measures have the potential to avoid 0 0.3 degrees Celsius of warming by the 2040s, while yielding important benefits, including improving public health and agricultural productivity. The pledge calls on countries to support the work of several organizations with, with existing methane reduction in initiatives, such as the Climate and Cleaner Coalition, and because basically we are considered a global leader in efforts to reduce methane and work with countries to reduce it from all major emitting sectors, including agriculture, fossil fuels, and waste. As part of the work that we do, we did in COP, um, the, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition had what is called the, clean, the Climate and Clean Air Ministerial, where actually 46, um, six of our, 46 of our countries, of our partners, kicked off uh, a new phase of the CCAC which basically focuses on reduce, significantly reducing methane this decade in line with the recommendations of the Global Methane Pledge of the GMA, and also the UNEP uh, emissions gap report. Uh, we also were gonna go work on speeding up reductions on HFCs and black carbon. And most importantly here in this webinar, we actually also pledge to support the implementation of the Global Methane Pledge. So how will uh, CCAC do this? The CCAC has uh, a, what is it called, a hub that will work on national planning. And this is basically will support, this support is aimed at tailoring the solutions we have to the priorities of each country through this process that we have, it's called the planning process. Uh, countries are supported to identify the right solutions that will maximize local benefits for health, food security, and other development priorities, while also contributing to inter international emissions mitigation goals. Um, we take a whole of government approach and engage across sectors and ministries. There are basically three um, general stages, three general stages in the planning process. One, the first one is called basically initial engagement and where we determine the needs and the request for support. The second one is where basically developing the plan and actually that has different tasks, which include creating a foundation. Um, that's is coordinating the team, what is the emissions policy inventory, determining priority measures, analyze, analyze, analyzing uh, governance and institutional capacity. We also then prepare the plan, which means modeling scenarios, quantifying the benefits, raising awareness, and choosing the implementation pathway. And then also we have uh, what's very important is basically obtaining political support. So support makes really, make sure that we have the support from all ministries that are involved in, in, in this, and they are involved in that have a, a, a say in, in need to be implementing the measures. That last stage, which is stage three, is coordinated in the implementation plan. Uh, there we provide basically technical, institutional, and financial support for policy and mitigation. And then also as part of this one is we include monitoring, reporting, and verification activities. Um, and then uh, so overall, uh, not just with uh, the planning, we also for the other, for the sectoral hubs that we have, uh, we, 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 we offer different types of, of, of support. Uh, we are able to provide training and capacity building, expert assistance and resources, support for developing regulation and policies, um, technology demonstration, science and research, and political outreach and awareness. Our partners work closely together on the trajectory towards a common goal, and we also help support not just through funding projects, but also through matchmaking our partners with the right expertise. Uh, the unique niche of the CCAC is the build buy-in at the national level and bring the coalition partners together at, at a political level. Uh, this diverse partnership is another resource which provides a wide range of technology, of, te of technical expertise and built on a wealth of knowledge to draw from. Our partners basically work together and support each other in the trajectory towards a common goal. Um, like I was mentioning, we have different um, hubs, but one of the hubs that we have is, is the waste hub, basically, because uh, our hubs are, are mostly sectoral. So be, given that the waste sector is responsible for two short-lived climate pollutants, and those are basically methane and black carbon, that's why we have this, this hub. And the, 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 the hub... Uh, 
for each job that we have is we have basically a CC in what are called engagement strategies and where we set out the goals and milestones for key topics and sectors of the CCAC. Um, and then it's for, for the waste sector, we have uh, the, the we had the engagement strategy includes improving uh, waste management to reduce short-lived climate pollutants, in particular methane, and to deliver local environmental, economic, and health benefits. Um, as you know, you know we, we focus on methane because basically for in the waste sector, um, it is the waste is the third largest source of anthropogenic methane emissions globally. Uh, and this comes from the anaerobic decomposition of organic waste in landfills and large dumps, um, as well, um, we also uh, are, are not, we take into account that actually in our, in developing countries, over 50% of the municipal solid waste is organic. So that's basically where we, we, can, we get a lot of methane from. Um, in landfills and actually in waste management make up about 20% of the, of the global anthropogenic methane emissions. Um, because of this, all of this, this is why the, one of the main niche of, of, of CCAC in the waste sector is basically organic waste management. Likewise, we also focus on landfill gas capture and um, making sure that it is either used or it is flare. Um, so in, 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 for in the organic waste, we work towards preventing organic waste uh, diverted from landfills and open dust, making sure that it doesn't arrive to, in landfills so it, it doesn't generate methane. Uh, then we do uh, the, uh, promoting the collecting and using and flaring of landfill gas, make sure that that methane that is generating the landfills, it is uh, burned or destroyed. And then actually, lastly, we also make sure that we develop economic uses and facilities for organics from either from such, um, from the end products of composting and anaerobic digestion. Uh, I, one other thing that I wanted to mention, and, and this is relevant because this is uh, you and Habitat is, is hosting this webinar, is um, some of the uh, key activities that we're going to have within the Waste Hub is basically we're going to be working a lot with the national governments advocating for action on waste and convening cities in the effort. So basically, this is what we call a vertical integration to making sure that um, the cities are working al in alignment with the governments. Um, we're going to we'll be working on creating support, supportive policy, regulatory environment, and assisting um, the development of, of strategies to prioritize uh, finance and engage the private sector. Um, we're also going to work with uh, with cities and local government because many cities are you know are have the mandate to to do the waste management, and then we're also going to work to support national uh, supporting regional workers and making sure that we work uh, peer to peer. Um, you can find resources of that CCAC has created. You, you can just go to our website uh, ccacoalition.org. And then I wanted to focus um, that we actually have a an area where it's, the, uh, it's called methane technical assistance, where they, you can find more tools for methane mitigation. And like for example, we have a tool um, that is basically an assessment of environmental and societal benefits of methane reduction. It's a web tool that you can see here in the left. And then for the waste, we have uh, different other tools and resources on landfill gas and organic waste management that are helpful to reduce methane. And we also have a, a solid waste emission estimation tool for cities uh, that was developed by uh, EPA on behalf of CCAC. Um, lastly, uh, we will do, uh, like I said, CAC will be one of the key partners supporting the GMP. And uh, so we will have projects and planning and sectoral actions, um, doing national, having national consultants to build capacity and coordinate response, uh, engage key players under sectoral hubs. Um, and we're going to also have uh, addi additional advocacy tools under what is called the CCAC methane flagship. And they will also support GMP communications and events. Like I mentioned, the last thing we were, we're when CCAC is going to be doing is this methane flagship. Um, basically, the the CCAC will uh, was uh, will, was launched also at COP26, and the flagship aims to engender a global enabling environment necessary to reduce human cost and methane emissions by 2030 to levels consistent with the findings of the global methane assessment. So we're going to be working with this, and this is basically the goals, and this is going to be done by to for many countries uh, that are partners of CCAC. 
Uh, and with that, I am done with my presentation. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me, but I also look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra, for the presentation. Your, your presentation was really informative on the methane, not only the basic points of the methane emission, but also technical points and the details of methane emission was really useful, I think. And also thank you for emphasizing the relations between the waste management and climate pollutant emissions. Thank you very much. So next, uh, we, we will invite the next presenter who is Reka, Reka Sos. So um, Reka is a managing director of the Resource and Waste Advisory Group. And she has been acting as climate change mitigation expert on various projects working for the EBRD, EU and GIZ. Also, she has uh, several experiences on the project with the Green Climate Fund, GCF, in different cities. Um, today, uh, she will talk about the how to access to climate finance for waste management project. So, Leka, please, floor is yours now. Okay, thank you very much. Let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, so it should be okay now, right? You can see my slide. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I admit that I haven't spent a lot of time preparing this uh, presentation per se, but having worked uh, for the last uh, almost 20 years in this field, um, it's just my thoughts about where we are now with the climate finance for the sector and also a little bit of where we are coming from and what opportunities are there. And then I will also speak a, a little bit about the um, waste management flagship project of South Africa that uh, we have prepared for um, the Green Climate Fund. Um, I'm very happy to be part of this um, webinar together with uh, colleagues uh, from uh, different funds and different organizations are very relevant for, uh, for this sector. So um, I'm sure many of you know, and uh, but just as a reminder, I put up here that uh, we have basically uh, a sector which is not a, a really huge contributor and sometimes uh, viewed as an orphan of the climate finance world because of that, but we should be re reminded that actually this four or 5% of, um, that we attribute uh, to the sector, waste sector and wastewater sector from global emissions <clears throat> does not represent the mitigation potential because there are um, about 10-15% uh, GSG reduction pot potentials uh, from global um, emissions, if we look at all the recovery options and if we look at what may happen downstream with some of the materials. And uh, recent studies uh, have shown that uh, about 30 to, five, to 50% of our emissions could be mitigated through um, circular economy interventions because a lot of the emissions come from the way we uh, use resources and produce uh, the stuff we, um, we consume. Uh, this takes into account also the energy that is uh, needed for these manufacturing processes. And I don't have to remind you, everybody knows about the buzzwords of the circular economy, but these of course include everything about prevention, eco-design, um, the sharing type of business models and so on. I also wanted to spend uh, just a moment
production um, processes and will increase food security, economic resilience, and, and so on, even health. So about waste sector and climate finance. Um, I'm old enough to have been working on the sustainable development mechanisms under the Kyoto Protocol, and they are to some extent still around. They focus on landfill gas extraction, composting and organic treatment afterwards, and plastic recycling. Um, when the whole uh, Kyoto Protocol intervention project started, um, waste sector was one of the most active. Uh, everything focused a lot on landfill gas extraction. And uh, among many uh, different reasons, uh, one reason for which CDM was criticized and not seen as the best mechanism to, to finance climate initiatives was because of this narrow focus of, the, um, of those projects and, and recognizing that there is a need for a more system-wide approach, which came through um, the so-called NAMA project, NAMA um, uh, instrument of the UNFCCC, which then turned also into um, a kind of a funding option, which was a, a period in between uh, Kyoto and uh, the Paris Agreement, which brought ar uh, around the Green Climate Fund. But under the NAMA facility, I wanted to emphasize that the uh, waste sector was again quite successful. We have a series of projects uh, which were developed during that time and are still being implemented. Uh, so, for example, in Peru, um, we have seen a NAMA facility focusing on private sector participation in the waste sector. Famously, India had a um, recycling and RDF production project financed by the NAMA facility, which was um, very much debated and um, and continuously refined until the right formula was found for this project because it had to ensure an inclusive waste management system and at the same time um, uh, produce the emission reductions at a reasonable price. Then uh, there is also the China NAMA facility project which is running uh, in a very successful way and then the Mozambique um, one which is focusing on the EPR, setting up the EPR system. I do have a couple of slides um, on these examples. I'm not gonna enter into details, but the one on Mozambique is, uh, is especially um, successful. The whole um, investment um, plan for, for enhancing recycling is uh, embedded into uh, to the, the way the NAMA facility project was conceived which is to introduce this legislation, the EPR, and then in parallel invest in um, these uh, recycling centers, which are now being developed in, in Maputo, Mozambique. Um, in China, things, things rolled out quite easily because um, the project itself, the financing from the NAMA facility focused on technical assistance while um, the investment funds came from the government. Um, then we have, of course, the Green Climate Fund, which came, uh, which is uh, perhaps the one of the most recent uh, funds, which is uh, available for the waste sector. And uh, colleagues will talk about this more in detail. Uh, so far, and as far as I know, and colleagues will, of course, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, there hasn't been a project focused solely on waste management through the Green Climate Fund. The ones I'm aware of, which do have a waste sector component are the Development Bank of South Africa run Climate Finance Facility, which uh, focuses on private sector lending and on waste to energy on the countries that are listed there. On the slide, Namibia, Lesotho, Eswatini, and South Africa, of course. And then there are also wider urban development projects, such as EBRD's Green City Action Plans and the following investments, which have waste sector and um, circular economy components. And then there is a project preparation finance allocation to the waste, flag the South Africa's 
flagship program, but uh, that the, the financing is still pending and maybe Drajan um, would be able to speak more about that. Um, just to mention that there are some other economic instruments which are climate finance related out there, the voluntary carbon markets, uh, which are, uh, there are uh, waste sector projects developed and financed through the voluntary carbon markets, but the prices for the waste sector are um, less appealing for the emission reduction unit. Uh, are, I mean, are less in general than, for example, the Lulu CF projects, the land use and the forestry projects, um, just because waste is seen as a dirty sector. But also uh, for voluntary carbon markets, the transaction costs in our sector are very high because the whole um, idea of proving additionality and uh, following and monitoring the projects in such a rigorous manner, which is asked by the carbon markets is very difficult at the moment. There is also a waste sector climate bond criteria since 2019. So, um, Climate bonds are possible as a finance instrument. There are also carbon tax finance mechanisms in different countries which consider waste sectors. So for example, in South Africa, it's possible to offset uh, emissions in the waste sector. And then of course the IFI, uh, the international finance institutions are increasingly earmarking their finance for climate. The targets are very ambitious. So for example, EIB and EBRD would like to have 50% of all their financing um, from climate finance or relevant for mitigation or adaptation by 2025. For the World Bank, the same ambition is at 35%. Uh, there are some emerging opportunities at the moment. One of them is the City Climate Finance Gap Fund which is launched in September 2020 and has a component for waste sector, which is dedicated to the sector. And um, it is supposed to uh, target 100 million US dollar investment, which would leverage a total of 4 billion if we consider the, the private finance impacts as well. The GAP Fund is an initiative of the Federal Republic of Germany and the Global Covenant of Mayors for climate and energy. It's implemented by the EIB, World Bank, and the GIZ. And the nice thing it is that it's working directly with city networks. So it's very relevant to this network as well. And maybe all the participants to this webinar to know about this option where cities can approach, approach the fund and ask, ask for um, help in developing their project to various stages of feasibility. And then, of course, there are other things. I just talk from my own experience to this, with the things that I've been somehow connected to. Uh, there's the World Bank Carbon Partnership Facility since 2012. There is an EU Urban Development Technical Facility focusing, uh, among many other things, on circular economy and waste. It's a huge technical assistance, which will largely target Africa. So um, that's coming up. And of course, around this table, colleagues will talk about other opportunities. And just a couple of work, words about the waste management flagship program, which was um, handed into the development, uh, handed into the GCF, but not yet financed. It's advised to be resubmitted. And uh, from what I hear from colleagues from the DEA at South Africa and the Development Bank of South Africa, it will be resubmitted in 2023. Mm -hmm. It's um, one of the eight near-term programs for climate mitigation uh, of, in the climate response policy of South Africa. Um, there are five technologies targeted in this program um, for municipalities and for organic waste, including open windrow composting, in-vessel composting, and uh, decentralized containerized composting, so lots of composting but also anaerobic digestion and uh, biomass pretreatment for nutrient upcycling. So pretreatment of organic waste um, can then prepare the waste for different uses uh, and low carbon pathways. 
Um, this project has been developed in six pilot municipalities and is to be um, upscaled into 16 municipalities. Um, I'm showing here the project initiators, the project team and pilot municipalities. Uh, so you see a lot of logos. I won't go into detail. Um, maybe what you need to know as municipalities who are participating is uh, the extent of the documentation which was necessary. And here's just a list of documents which were submitted, um, uh, I think more than a year ago to the Green Climate Fund, the full funding proposal with all the annexes. Um, here is a slide showing uh, the flows, the uh, process flows for all the technologies, but um, won't go into detail. If you have questions, we can go back to this discussion. Then the climate related benefits, um, they include uh, quite a large mitigation impact. We have considered the whole life cycle of the a mitigation, um, which includes uh, reductions, which are probably not reported in IPCC, but are taken into account, for example, in the uh, short-lived climate pollutant tool, which is available from CCAC, our colleague Sandra. Um, and it, the climate benefit reaches uh, 6.32 million uh, CO2 equivalent. Much of this is methane reduction during the implementation period. Um, 833,000 people would be directly impacted by adaptation benefits and 8.19 million indirectly. This is a um, theory of change, again, showing you the kind of uh, documentation you need to prepare if you would like to access the Green Climate Fund. Um, and then the finance and economic uh, considerations um, are shown. Or we uh, we uh, presented the baseline and then also uh, the treatments in that are in the South, Af South Africa at the moment. The, in the baseline municipalities have limited resources and low capacity to attract uh, investment, especially the, the, the secondary municipalities, which were the target of this program. Um, and then uh, our analysis um, resulted in these following financial and economic uh, results, which is the total program cost would be 28 mil beyond 28 million US dollars. We had requested, or DBSA and, and DEA had requested 20 million uh, US dollars from the GCF in grant financing. And the cost per ton was uh, below the five US dollars per CO2, ton of CO2 equivalent. So that's all I had to say today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to discussions in the panel. Thank you very much, Rekka. Thank you very much for the very nice presentations. So, and also the thank you for the interesting information, which is on a, a bit of history that how waste management has been included in, in climate change context. And of course the information, which is most attractive for us probably, that the topics of the economic instruments for municipal solid waste management, and as well as the exact project interaction. That was super informative for ACCP members, I think. Thank you very much. So now we will invite the next presenter, uh, Drazen. I will introduce um, himself, uh, about him a bit. So the Drazen is uh, lead of global urban development and energy efficiency sector. Um, sorry, at the GCF Green Climate Fund. Also, he is responsible for the GCF portfolio portfolio of over thirty projects at different stages of development, funding considerations, and implementations. And also act, he's actively engaged in the conceptual work and the community of practices on the risking structures and transform, transformative interventions in the global urban and energy efficiency context at the GCF. 
So Drazen, thank you very much uh, that your time to make a presentation. I will share your presentation now. Thank you very much, Iho. If you can, please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, make it a full, full screen, please. Yes. yes. You have a perspective on climate financing and waste. Um, can we go to the next slide? Sorry, the slide is not, ah, yes. Yeah, okay, so just for a reminder, the GCF was established in 2010 as an operating entity of the financial mechanism of the Paris Agreement. The fund's mandate is to, prom to promote the paradigm shifting towards low emission and climate resilient development pathways by providing support to developing countries to limit or reduce their greenhouse gas emission from mitigation perspective and to adapt to the impacts of climate change from adaptation perspective. GCF is a signatory of Global Methane Pledge at COP26. And also I have to say in six years of my practice at GCF leading the urban sector, the uh, South African waste management proposal was the only waste management proposal we have seen in a six years at GCF. And proposal itself had its number of weaknesses that I'm going to discuss a bit later. Next slide. So the role of Green Climate Fund is uh, above all to provide the risk and concessionality um, where we are reducing risk in transaction, uncommon role for co-investors, fostering behavioral changes conducive to stronger climate impacts, cremating demand by making climate solutions affordable. We also have instruments of concessionality where we have appliance and concessionality, subordinated positions in projects and financial structures, flexible term and tenors, flexible guarantees, and fit for purpose grants to foster future climate action. So when we say fit for purpose grants, uh, the initial DBSA request for the flagship waste management project in South Africa that you have seen has been $65 million in grants, which was deemed absolutely unacceptable from GCF perspective. Next slide. So we are looking for above all additionality of GCF funding. Projects must crowd in additional financing on the top of GCF. We cannot be the only game in town that support the projects. Projects need to have strong climate rationale and not developmental focus, like many projects do, where the climate impact is in, of investment is the key and scientific evidence is to be provided properly as to what is the climate influence or climate impact that is going to be achieved by the project. We need to have a fully country-driven approach by support alignment with NDCs and support of the national designated authority. We need to adhere to six investment criteria, such as the impact potential, paradigm shift potential, sustainable development potential, recipient needs, country ownership, efficiency, effectiveness. We then have eight results areas for in mitigation for adaptation. We, of course, need to have full compliance with GCF policies, and we need to have a completeness of documentation when considering projects. The biggest issue with GCF is that we are constantly receiving more projects than we can finance, and we have ability to finance just for B34, uh, board meeting 34 this year in, in uh, October. We already have over 45 projects for financing, uh, seeking maybe $4.5 billion of financing, where for this particular board meeting, we may have available up to 1 billion in financing. So th this is just giving you a very clear picture of the demand uh, overseas supply uh, five to tenfold. Next slide. Uh, so we support a range of financial instruments, grants with or without repayment, equity, ordinary junior, concessional loans and guarantees through project-based SPVs, direct equity debt funds, funds of funds, structure solutions, or pure, pure lending. Next slide. This is very important also in the context of um, <clears throat> South Africa and the, the only waste management proposal we currently have on the table. Uh, we need to see how... Um, how really the urban climate financing really works uh, on, the, on the level between national governments and local governments. I mean, if you look into the municipal financing situation and sector in South Africa, it is considered that up to 80% of municipalities are completely bankrupt. So the first question is if the waste management operations cannot achieve cost recovery, 
why would GCF be throwing grant, grant money for that and for what purpose and how we would uh, uh, isolate the um, uh, you know, uh, bankrupt municipalities from the healthy core of the project in the implementation structure. Um, the um, answer to this lies always when it comes to waste management and climate finance is that waste management is partially a developmental challenge and partially a climate challenge. Uh, and therefore the, the developmental challenge has to be financed through other sources, uh, on sources of the government, subsidies, um, you know, local government uh, collection, uh, waste management collection fees and so forth. Whereas the climate impact and climate portion of the project should be then considered through climate finance means, but they have to be very clearly understood and separated so that, you know, we, we cannot use climate finance money to actually cover what is the uh, you know core cost recovery challenge in uh, in African South African municipalities, which actually do not pay for their waste management? Yeah, so we we have to look into top down or bottom up approaches, central transfers, ad hoc revenues, divestment pressures, decentralization press pressures. So national government levels, we have opportunities such as the wider institutional capacities, convening power and political concentration. And of course, threats that are limiting local fiscal capacity, of course, efficiencies because of the bureaucracy and financial management capacities. On a local government level, we have usually opportunities in flexible governance, uh, good fiscal space in terms of land and properties um, and uh, land value management and so forth, and maybe increased efficiency, but also we have problems with technical capacities, accountability, and financial management institutional capacity. So whether bottom-up approaches or top-down approaches are used, uh, the picture of municipal finance and the way how the cost recovery in normal municipal operation really works is the core to understanding, first of all, how to create a normal, normally functioning business model. And then on the top of this, to see how we can resolve climate-induced issues by climate financing instruments, which was uh, to date really missing from the BSA approach in waste management in South Africa. Next slide. So we've been talking a lot about 1.5 degrees and two degrees scenario um, here. And um, I will reveal both privately and I think institutionally where we stand. So if we uh, stick to uh, 1.5 degree scenarios, we would have about global carbon budget of about 750 gigatons of CO2 equivalent until 2030 that we can use uh, before reducing the CO2 where Whereas in two degree scenarios, the global carbon budget until 2030 is a little bit bigger, larger, 1,050 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, but I mean, just to give you some clue, if we continue the existing urbanization trend uh, with massively increasing urban population across the world, which is uh, going to be expanding to, to the level of 2.5 billion by 2050, only by focusing on the way we construct the urban infrastructure in terms of use of cement and construction techniques and buildings, we would already spend about 350 gigatons of CO2 emissions. So the transformative urban planning and early climate intervention in urban structure is phenomenally important and urgent uh, because it continues to be resource intensive and high carbon organization process. So this all leads us to the next slide, um, essentially suggesting that look, 1.5 degree scenarios is dead in the water, right? I mean, it can, you know, there's a 50-50% chance that will never be reached. Um, you know, it cannot be reached unless we start using techniques for removing CO2 out of the atmosphere, which is not happening fast enough. If you have seen uh, the uh, rebounding of fossil industry, we would say, look, for all practical purposes, the 1.5 degree scenario is dead in the water, meaning that we have to look into uh, CO2 concentration doubling in the earth uh, in the next uh, 50 to 60 years, unless if we continue to follow the current trend, which would lead to um, warmth between 2.6 and 4.1 degree scenarios. All of these um, boundaries are phenomenally dangerous. I mean, if you go for 2.6 degree scenarios and higher, you would have uh, food crisis, um, parts of earth not, not really livable anymore, especially for instance, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and you would have a, a significant increase in the ocean levels due to the ice melting. So I don't wanna create a doom scenario, but I mean, we do not really believe that 1.5 is doable. Let's just hope to see that maybe two degrees is doable, but I mean, the way everything is pointing, we will even bridge the two degree scenario 
uh, at, at this stage. Of course, it's not too late and let's all work together that this is not happening. Next slide. <clears throat> So how solid waste contributes to climate change? Solid waste creates uh, about 5% of total global emissions from solid waste management sector. We have uh, primary sources of GHG gases, such as disposal waste in open dams, disposal in landfills without landfill gas collection systems. And we have other ways that the greenhouse gases are emitted from solid waste, such as the inadequate waste collection, uncontrolled dumping, and burning of waste. Next slide. Uh, from IPCC report, we, we can see the relationship between the income and GHG emissions in the waste sector. Area of circle is proportional to aggregate emission in, in that country. We can see where low, middle, low income, lower middle income, upper middle income, and high income countries are in terms of waste management emissions. And there is a clearly positive relationship between income and emissions in the waste sector. The richer the country, the more emissions they're coming through, right? So we have to take care of that as well. Next slide. So according to IPCC, methane makes up to 90% of GHG emissions from the waste, and nitrous oxide makes up to remaining of 10%. Other green gases such as carbon dioxide are non-methane volatile organic compounds and are released in trace quantities. The main impact of methane is on a global scale as a greenhouse gas. All the levels of methane in the environment are relatively low. It's high global warming potential, which is, by the way, 20 time, 21 times higher that, than that of carbon dioxide, ranks it among the worst of the greenhouse gas, gases. So fighting uh, methane uh, pollution from waste management makes serious sense, and it definitely is a priority for everybody in climate business. Next slide. Impacts of climate change on solid waste. Above all, we will see increase in temperature, precipitation, and flooding that will uh, bring increase in mosquitoes, flies, and other disease carrying insects. It will increase in frequency of waste collection due to other issues, alternation of organic waste decomposition rate, increasing methane generation, if we're not careful, increasing in flooding, increasing in amount of leachate, landfills in coastal low lying areas where will be more prone to the flooding, inaccessibility to some areas due to the restriction collection areas and infrastructure possibly permanently inundated and therefore inaccessible also for the waste collection. So that's that's where we are heading unless we are careful. Next slide. Now, GHG emission reductions along the solid waste management chain very quickly. Um, if we, uh, we have extraction and manufacturing, GHG emissions are coming from extraction of natural resources, transport of raw materials to manufacturing facilities, harvesting trees and use of fossil fuels for energy transportation, our mitigation strategy are focusing on reducing amount of waste generated that has to be collected, transported, treated, and disposed of, and the use and recycling of goods, reduce use of virgin materials, and increase the efficiency of processes. Next slide. In terms of collection and transportation of waste, emission is coming primarily from the fossil fuel use for waste collection and transportation fleet. On mitigation side, we have to have a reduction in amount of waste generated, route and fleet optimization, use of hybrid electric vehicles, use of alternative fuels, valid means of transportation and on-site or neighborhood composting. Next slide. In recycling, we have a fossil fuel use for collecting, transporting, and recycling activities. Mitigation is to use as much less energy than extracting virgin materials to make recycling make sense from climate perspective. Next slide. From recovery perspective, GHG emissions are coming again from fossil fuel use for collecting and transporting, and GHG emissions from composting, anaerobic digestion, and waste incineration processes. So from mitigation perspective, we need to avoid, avoid methane generation from landfills where possible. We need to use compost sludge to reduce the need for chemical fertilizers manufactured from fossil fuels. We need to use compost sludge that reduces the water for irrigation, thus less energy needed for water treatment and transportation. And we need to use anaerobic digestion that uses methane as a fuel source, thus displacing other fossil fuels. All of this is, of course, technically possible. Next slide. Finally, in landfilling and organic wastes, uh, GHG emissions are coming from anaerobic decomposition of organic waste, fossil fuel use, leachate treatment, and clearing land for a landfill site. Mitigation strategies are ban on disposal of organic waste in landfills, reducing organic waste going to waste and improving the sophistication of landfills, landfill gas collection system, and use of landfill gas to generate heat and power, thereby displacing fossil fuels for base sources. Next slide. Finally, GHG emission from solid waste sector summary. 
we have seen, in fact, that largest decrease in GHG emissions came from the solid waste sector over a 15 year period. However, because of the open dumping, there is a common practice for majority of developing countries. This form of disposal releases methane directly into atmosphere. So there's still a lot of work to be done in the sector itself, as previous speakers pointed out very clearly. Next slide. In appendix, I'm not going to go through it, just go next slide. I have provided just a second before that, one, one up. So thank you very much. This um, I think this opportunity could be a really, really excellent opportunity for all of us to learn GCF schemes. Also, as you mentioned, the cost recovery is always challenges for many cities, I think. So the, the approaches, <laughs> approaches for national authority and the local authority should be taken more. This is what I learned. Also, the the information on each categories or perspectives of municipal solid waste management and climate change that your the this provided us the important insight for the project development i think so thank you very much and then next um <clears throat> next is the last speaker i would like to invite jiao jiao tang from region 20. So let me introduce a bit of Jiao. So Jiao is an environmentalist who cares deeply about the acute planetary crisis that we face today, such as climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution and waste. And then she has worked for and with influential institutional organizations as well as climate change initiatives as and local NGOs and foundations with rich experience in advocacy, capacity building, technical assistance, and development corporations. So, Jiao, you ready? Yes, thank you, Shuho. Oh, okay, um, thank you very much. Yeah, so it's your. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, First of all, thank you uh, for the introduction. I think that was the, the, the older version. I'm happy to do it myself. And uh, thanks to you and Habitat for the invitation. I'm happy to see also familiar faces on the panel and looking forward to the discussion on um, also particularly the topic on waste management for Africa. Uh, I'm here today. Let me just quickly open up my presentation. So I'm here today to, I mean, in my presentation, I will talk about um, the organization, organization where I work and uh, more particularly uh, the Subnational Climate Finance Initiative that uh, we, together with uh, several other consortium members, uh, with the uh, initial funding from uh, Green Climate Fund, started operating since April last year, which could be, uh, you know, one of the um, climate financing sources for subnational infrastructure, um, in this case, waste management. So I'm the director of program at R20. Um, we, as R20, we were established in um, 2012 by uh, Governor Schwarzenegger. And there's a particular relevance to his position as the governor. He saw when he was um, the governor, the 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 kind of um, power and in initiatives that can be uh, done in terms of uh, clean energy, climate, um, climate change mitigation um, at the subnational level. So it was with that mandate that, that R20 was um, funded together with UNDP with the aim to uh, help subnational governments uh, basically build uh, infrastructure that's sustainable and, and climate neutral. 
Um, and our role has been always to connect the public and private sector to really facilitate the, the, the realization of, of such uh, projects. And we have evolved over the years, and I will I'll talk very briefly about that. Um, through our experience, we currently, we are really focused on, I mean, 90% of our work is, is focused on the subnational climate uh, finance initiative, but we have come through other way through our ex last five, six years of um, project experience on the ground. I will give you just some examples. Um, for example, we, we have uh, helped realize a uh, waste management system in Algeria. Uh, solar panels in Mali, in Kita, um, LED lighting in Brazil, and those are really like in, in Fiji as well, solar power, uh, solar power production. These are really projects where uh, we worked with subnational governments and we helped um, secure funding, uh, also investment funding to, to realize these projects. But we what we have realized um, through you know, those projects is that uh, we need to speed up the process. We need to scale up um, at this speed, project by project. We're not going to meet, you know, the goals that the previous, previous presenter has mentioned, you know, 1.5 or 2 degrees. So we've come to um, the point, like two, three years ago, really, to um, gather together like-minded institutions, from the private sector from and as well as the public sector to set up a, a fund level kind of uh, approach to speed up so what we realize in terms of gap the gap is that at the subnational level there is a, a huge gap of financing for mid-sized infrastructure and those are typically in, in the range of uh, five to 75 million um, and then this is also a typical range that waste management projects falls, falls uh, into. And we, we see that, you know, the sustainable infrastructure investment gap in, in uh, emerging economies uh, exceeds US dollars 500 billion per year. And local government's decisions can really make a huge difference in terms of GSG emissions and uh, meeting SDG goals as well. So with that in mind, we, uh, together with several other institutions, we started uh, initiating the Subnational Climate Finance Initiative. Um, and with the idea that we will create a fund that's a uh, blended finance model and how, I won't go too much into detail, but basically it's, it's blended in the way that uh, first we have a grant-like facility, which provides technical assistance to projects um, so that we can de-risk the project, we can assess projects, uh, better assess projects, and, uh, and help prepare projects to, uh, you know, bankability. Um, secondly, uh, we have, for example, in, in our case, we have green climate funds, um, concessional equity, um, in order to, well, first we can start investing, and secondly, we, uh, with this concessionality, it's, it's easier to attract private sector um, equity, uh, so investors. Uh, with these two uh, elements designed into this, this um, system, we, we, we have now the blended finance uh, vehicle. It's a private equity fund with a tech, technical assistance facility. Um, and all of our impacts, and you will see that in the next slides as well, are to be certified by Gold Standard, which is an internationally well-known standard setting body on SDG and uh, carbon emission. So that we make sure that the impacts that we aim and claim at the end uh, will be uh, certifiable, it's ju not just you know, impact washing. So uh, just very quickly on the, on the strategy of our um, SEF, we do have several sectors of focus, one of which is in waste. And, must say that at the at the stage of designing um, you know the fund proposal to the GCF um, uh, we analyzed the climate like uh, mitigation impacts per dollar invested from the waste sector actually we have the most amount of uh, uh, mitigation impacts 
from the waste sector compared to the other sectors we have uh, analyzed as as you see here but um yeah so we we look into sustainable energy solutions uh, we look into waste sector, urban development, sustainable agriculture, with an overarching uh, focus on uh, nature-based solutions, because IUCN, um, as you know, is, is leading on this topic and is our, our consortium member. We also have uh, impact targets, as you see on the, on the green, particularly in um, uh, CO2 equivalent mitigated. Uh, renewable energy production, jobs, job creation, um, and improvement of living conditions. And this particularly refer to, you know, uh, subnational uh, services like waste management and, and water and, and so on. So on the consortium of this initiative, we have R20. We are part of the technical assistance um, implementers. So we particularly we will source projects as R20, and we worked very closely with the fund manager um, Pegasus, which is based in the US, the, the, so far the uh, only accredited entity as fund manager in the, in, the, in the United States. So we work with them to really source projects um, and select projects and, and really go through the whole project cycle. Uh, but particularly R20 would, uh, we're managing the TA side uh, of project development. So we typically would do, you know, um, help developers to conduct uh, pre-feasibility studies, feasibility studies, and um, also environmental social impact assessment. Um, at some point also due diligence. But as I mentioned, we, we started operation, operating the, the SEF in April last year, and it's a seven years project. So we're still at the you know, beginning of the journey. And then we have IUCN who oversees the, the uh, te technical assistance facility. They're um, leading on capacity building uh, and gold standard uh, also has a component uh, in the TA to develop uh, new methodologies on impact measurement. Um, and eventually all the the, the, at the fund level, we're going to be certified by Gold Standard, and at project level, some of the projects will be certified as well. Um, and lastly, uh, on, on the fund, in terms of the, um, the amount of financing we have available, so the technical assistance facility, we have a GCF contribution of 18.5 million. We are fundraising to aim for a 28 million uh, TA facility. Uh, on the fund level, uh, when I say fund, it really means the, the private equity investment fund. Uh, we also have a concessional equity from the GCF of uh, 150 million. We are aiming to fundraise another 600 uh, million to reach 700 million. That's the goal of, of the size of the fund. And finally, this is a mechanism how uh, the gold standard certifies on the fund level and on the project level. I won't go into detail, but basically the idea is that we will have our fund processes, uh, decision-making and, and strategy certified, but also at the project level. So once the investments are in, in our portfolio, every investment uh, company would uh, have to comply with the um, impact measurement and reporting standards on a regular basis and report back to our ESG manager of the fund. Um, and this will be uh, regularly checked by Gold Standard. Um, this is the list of our beneficiary countries. Those are the countries we, uh, which are you know, members of the UNFCCC and uh, GCF. And because our uh, anchor funding comes from GCF, we, we do have to obtain non-objection or support letters from, from countries. Um, and within the period of time, we managed to secure quite a lot of um, NOL. And yeah, so you can see we, we are able to invest in Africa. We we're able to invest in Asia and Latin America and Africa, quite a lot of countries. Um, this is not an exclusive uh, list of uh, uh, criteria. It's just to give 
everybody a sense of what we're looking at. So our ticket size is five to 70, 75 million US dollars. Uh, we're looking at a proven growing, uh, there needs to be a, a need and this particularly would come from the subnational governments um, in collaboration with the, the uh, ministry, the NDA, the nationally designated um, agents. Um, we need to have, we need, we're looking at established technologies from leading providers and the projects of course have to be replicable, scalable, and there must be a, a business model, like it's, it's an investment. Um, on the TA side, we, do, we don't grant money, but we provide uh, TA in terms of you know, technical assistance, um, pre-feasibility studies, uh, project development, um, and some of the projects may not eventually go to investment stage. So we can kind of imagine a kind of funnel approach. We will provide TA to uh, more projects than uh, eventually how many will be invested. That, that's that's the, um, the process. So we will also need to have limited ES risk, which means particularly in the waste sector, we will not uh, invest into large scale incineration waste to energy. Um, our strategy is more looking at, uh, you know, simpler and lower operational uh, risks projects such as composting, anaerobic digestion, sorting, uh, you know, producing RDF, um, maybe in some cases pyrolysis, but we really have to look at the feasibility of such operations. So. This is just a, a selected list of criteria that I want to show to you, but for the full list, you are able to see on our website, which I put here, the subnational.finance, uh, the, the project process, the, uh, fund re the fund requirement and eligibility criteria are all listed there, including country list. So uh, with that, I finish my presentation and happy to answer your, uh, your questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jiao. Thank you for the, your wonderful presentation. So I, I would say um, under the African Crisis Platform, we have conducted baseline survey in, in some of the member cities last year and this year. And we identified uh, lot, lots of infrastructure investment gaps and also policy gaps. So um, your insight and experience on the integrated blended things, also some of the portfolio and the selection criteria was super insightful. Thank you very much. And then, uh, So now we will move on to the uh, next session. However, I think we are super behind of the scheduled time. So I would go to the panel discussion. So the speakers, uh, Sandra, Lika, Drazen, Jiao, could you please Turn on your camera. Sandra, hi. Can you also? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. So now I would like to ask you some of the questions about the waste and climate change. So my first question is how African cities can access to climate finance for waste management improvement in their cities. Maybe, um, Leka, do you have any idea or opinion? Yes, well, I'm the only person on this panel who is not from a financing organization for the for the cities, I'm actually only a consultant. Um, maybe I can tell a couple of words about the EIB GIZ uh, climate City Gap Fund. Uh, we are um, 
consortium partner there with GFA implementing the waste framework technical assistance um, project. So uh, I do believe uh, my, co uh, my colleague, my client actually from GIZ, uh, Kadri Steinerberger is maybe on the line, uh, but um, in any case, uh, this fund is currently looking at options uh, to develop um, project ideas into feasibilities and they offer technical assistance uh, for this. And they also have uh, an interest to then fin uh, finance this type of project uh, later on from um, EIB and World Bank sourced financing. So it's worthwhile to check out the Climate City Gap Fund. I will type it in the chat box um, so that everybody can then look it up. That would be my answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so the, I think, Jiao, you have a, a bit of the, the good experience on this question. Do you have any opinion? Yeah, happy to share some thoughts. I mean, today on the panel, we, we are already kind of exposing quite a lot of uh, financing opportunities and channels where, you know, people could look into and there are a lot more out there. I can say also, you know, the SCF is just one of the um, mechanisms that GCF has supported. There are several others that's, that's um, you know, in the pipeline and are in, being implemented. Um, on the... On the local level, I mean, I have, uh, you know, prior to R20, I worked at the International Solid Waste Association for quite a long time. And my experience typically is that, um, and together with what, what kind of projects we're looking at now, is that one, yes, uh, there's an information, uh, lack of information on uh, financing sources. And secondly, there's a kind of lack of capacity. And I mean, we all know that. Um, but in very particular, you know, when we talk about uh, investment funding, let's say, um, investors are looking at projects that are bankable. Maybe it doesn't have to be, you know, very high return, but there has to be a return. Um, and this, I mean, it's a very big topic when we, let's say, let's use Africa. Um, we, we see projects coming from municipalities, either they are totally uh, unrealistic, you know, like 1000 tons per day of uh, gasification. We don't see that in Europe. So I think there, 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 is, a, there, there is a lack of capacity in also understanding the waste sector. And so uh, it's very, and that's why we incorporated the capacity building element in our, in our TA. We will conduct workshops in um, the, the, the four regions of our focus, for example, Latin America, uh, Mediterranean, Africa, we will conduct them um, really with the audience of the NDAs and the local governments to kind of talk about the sector in general, but also what investors, uh, you know, public, private investors are looking for. We, we need, you know, um, a, a strong project developer. It doesn't have to be the local government but somebody who pulls this project off, um, a kind of, uh, you know, financing structuring, whether the, the municipality would co-invest or, or, or not, and, and what kind of role they play. So, I mean, sorry, there's a lot to say in that. I think the time is very, no very short. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I will stop here. I'm sure uh, other colleagues on the panel have things to say. Thank you very much. So Sandra or Drazen, do you have any any comments on this? Sure, I have. Um, I think, uh, Shino, you have introduced a little bit of a controversy, I think, because you are relating uh, waste management with climate mm. finance. Uh, I think the best advice we can give to African cities is that they, first of all, should be mobilizing as many technical assistance as possible to conduct proper feasibility studies to find best ways to tackle their own waste management problems. But there has to be a clear distinction between you know, developmental issues in waste management and climate issues in waste management. So climate finance can only be used for the climate impact of the waste management issues in African cities, yeah? So I would say, um, you know, apply for technical assistance, do, uh, do a great deal of 
feasibility studies and technical studies necessary, and then start planning intervention in the proper sequence, understanding the developmental angle has to be financed from developmental finance and climate issues from climate finance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sandra? Yeah, from my side, I, I will second what uh, what has been said um, in, the, in the presentations, also what Jao mentioned, which is the cost recovery. Uh, you know, it, it, many people are not going to willing to invest if, if, if the municipality is not even able to recover some of the costs that it takes to, to really manage a, a, a waste properly. Um, you know, so we actually are, are working on that kind of trying to, to work to really move municipality to realize that they need to start charging their users. I know that in Africa, it might be challenging due to the income restrictions that many um, citizens might have, but there has to be a way. Likewise, there has to be also, we need to look at basically also what are the low hanging fruits? What can be, what can be uh, looked into maybe in commerce, like make sure that they're paying their fair share and maybe in trying to uh, start looking at option, for example, um, composting of, of, of organic waste from the large producers, from commerce, from uh, hotels, from restaurants. So setting up that and, and kind of really uh, making sure, like Jao mentioned, it's like there has to be bankable projects so more the private sector can get involved. And, uh, you know, in many of the, the things that we're seeing from our side is that they want really the private sector to get involved and the private is not, sector is not gonna get involved if there's not a bankable project or at least there's some cost recovery. So this is like a, is it, there's a circle, like you need one thing then to do to have the other, but it, it, there, there has to be a starting point. You have to start realizing what, what can I do? Uh, and I agree that we, there's there's need for feasibility studies, but the feasibility studies basically, if, if there's no cost recovery, they, they're gonna show you that the projects are not feasible. The other thing that we are also looking into is that um, maybe community-based uh, projects are a good starting point for, for many places, at least to, to start organizing the, 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 the citizens and the communities and kind of having that realization that there's a need uh, to pay for, 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 for waste management. It's not free, it's not nobody, the waste is not just gonna disappear and the solutions that are proposed are where waste just, I don't know where it goes, send it to the moon or whatever, but is they're not, is that it's not, we need to be realistic. And, and, and I think that a lot of people, once they know that there's a cost, once they know what is happening with the waste, they, they, they can get a little bit more conscientious and, and there might be a willingness to pay. The capacity is a little bit more tricky, but anything that could be recovered is, I think makes sense. That's it from my side. Thank you very much. Yeah, Rekha, are you-, yeah. you are, Just are want you? to add a very quick comment that there is, um, in the waste sector, there is an inherent need to look at the sector as a system, as a system. So a system-based approach is very important and which makes it a little bit difficult to define um, projects which focus only on the climate benefits. But uh, it's encouraging to see that at least the emerging, uh, the newly emerging opportunities focus a lot on the bio circular economy as a complete circle at least that's what I'm seeing in the EIB fund uh, that is currently um, being implemented. Thank yeah, you very much. That's my comment. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. So sorry, we have no time, but um, probably uh, next question is related to your, your comments, but I would like to ask the another question. So, what are the essential information and the stakeholders to be involved in? And what kind of the project is more attractive for the financing for the, for the project? Yes, Lekka, please. I have a quick answer to this. And I think here the GCF has a very good approach, uh, which is to look very much at the uptake markets. And I think this has been uh, quite new for our sector, uh, which was a push from the GCF to really do a market analysis of, on, of the outputs. And it's very important to have uh, um, products from re waste recovery, which will actually then also be used for the purposes which they are 
uh, recovered for. And I think one of the main stakeholders are the uptake markets in that sense, which we probably don't always think about in our sector. Thank you very much. So um, in terms of attractive, attractive mm -hmm. things, ah, yes, Jao, please. Yeah, so uh, it's for us, it's very simple. We look at impacts and we look at return. So if we <laughs> look at the project, we see, you know, CO2 equivalent, how much uh, a waste project can, can mitigate. Um, the higher the number, the better. And uh, in the waste sector, I think if you uh, divert it from a dump site or landfill, it's quite easy to, to calculate and estimate. And secondly, the return, and this draws back it draws us back to the topic of waste recovery and what uh, Rika has mentioned, market study of output products. What, that's what we do in, in the projects that we are looking at as well. We, we would always need to look at, you know, uh, besides, you know, the regulatory incentives and tendering process, but also uh, Latin America, when there's no very low or no gate fee, it almost cannot make the project work. And, and that goes beyond, you know, waste technology or solutions. It goes to policy level uh, legislation, you know, what kind of, um, what kind of uh, strategy a city or a nation wants to have in terms of increasing the waste budget like Sandra said, how to, to uh, incentivize or to make producers pay uh, so that you can actually charge a, a higher gate fee. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that, that goes beyond the local level and that goes beyond the, you know, just practicing of waste management. Thank you very much. Management. Thank you very much. Your 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 opinion is very very uh, yeah, informative and insightful. Like the gate fee thing is yeah sort of uh, it have to be in the discussion. And then maybe Drazen, you would like to add something or some from Sandra, if you have for the attractive financing for the project or what kind of information or stakeholders to be involved? I mean, I always believe that there is a need for strong regulatory reform in most of the developing countries, certainly in Africa, right? So um, it is not so difficult to diagnose what is, what is problematic with the majority of waste systems in, in countries in Africa. So, on the basis of that analysis, you know, there can be a drive for the regulatory reform that is going to institutionalize and balance the main issues related to stakeholders and prices and uh, quality of services in, in, you know, municipal waste sector. And once the regulatory reform is done, then we can start looking into, you know, specifics of perfecting the integrated waste management strategy, looking into you know, how to make it more efficient, less costly, start to separate waste, uh, recycle waste and so forth. And then look again from developmental and climate finance perspective. Yeah, so any any project in waste management today that is that tends to be a little bit more modern should be looking both from developmental and climate angle and combine financing for both. So I think the first step is, as I, as I said in the beginning, uh, my advice to African cities is please pick up on available technical assistance, either from EU or from EIB or from any other donor and start looking into the feasibility studies and necessary technical um, assistance issues that can help you start regulating and moving the strategy for waste management forward, both including the developmental perspective and climate finance angle, hence methane reduction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sandra, yes, please. 
Yeah, I was going to say, uh, you know, we, we talked about regulatory framework and, and one thing that like from, from our side from is that we're seeing that countries, many countries in, in Africa and, that, and, and all over the world have all these um, um, ambitious goals and they haven't actually put them in the NDCs or, you know, even signing the Global Methane Pledge. So I think one role for the cities are to really kind of talk to, start lobbying the, the government say, hey, we need better regulatory frameworks. We need, you know, for you to create this so we can have better waste management, you know. And then, because if you're gonna achieve, if you wanna achieve those goals, you need to you need to empower, you need to, the, the, the cities to, to be able to do this. So that's something, and I agree that it, that in the policy should be uh, tailored that enables this, that so they're, coming from a circular economy angle where you have, if you, you, you take the end product where, and you can use everything and actually, and really um, the, um, uh, incentivize the landfill and you know, kind of really valorize products. And maybe the other thing that is very important and, and this is mentioned in some pre in presentation is that we really need to reduce the waste, uh, the, the amount of waste that we're generating. So really trying to find solutions at how to really reduce that waste or stop not going to, to, to landfills, really valorize whatever we can and, and, and figure that out. Uh, so I'm, I would say that the, the, the cities have a, a, they should talk more. We, and this is something that CCAC wants to work on. It's this whole vertical integration because it's, we, both, not, both levels of government need each other. So, um, and, and I would say that, um, Yes, yes, and I, I would say they, they needs to start looking at solutions. And one thing actually I wanted to add is you actually do need the regulatory framework because in some cases compost, you cannot use compost for this, you cannot use compost for that. And then the other thing is that um, the there's not, the uses of lamp, compost is not as, as known as it should be. There's so many uses for it and the benefits of using it is so, uh, there's so many and for, and especially in Africa where you have, uh, um, depletion of the soils that you really need that as well. And the other thing that it could be that it should be taken account, into account, which is also a benefit, bringing back the whole concept of circular economies, maybe or, urban agriculture. So making sure that you have the right compost, the right fertilizers, organic compost for to do that. And then you can have uh, more um, access to more uh, agriculture nearby. That's it from my side. Yeah, thank you very much for the great comments or, or sort of feedback on this. Um, we have, uh, I think we have several questions in the chat box. However, the time is running. So I would like to um, close today's sessions. I'm really sorry on this, but I, I think today's, this fourth webinar session on waste and climate change, I think we could have the fruitful, really fruitful discussion. And um, it was super professional session, I, I believe. So um, thank you very much for, for joining us as a speaker. Even your time is now, it's very late night or super early morning. However, I would like to appreciate all of the speakers um, and listeners who joined today's webinar. So, um, we will have the, the last webinar, number five. Uh, it, it will be on the plastic pollution and marine litter. I, we, once we will ready, we will disseminate the information. So thank you very much for your participation to the, this session. I would appreciate it. Thank you very much. And then see thank you soon. You. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. It was nice to see you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.